registration. There's the Zoom registration, which most of you have found because you're here today. There's the forum homepage and any content I get from presenters or any code we might get sometimes goes on that forum page. So I'll have the meeting with the content from the meeting underneath it, uh, including the video. There's a YouTube playlist. I think we got about 20, 25 videos on there now from all of our last meetings. And then there's also a shared instance that we, uh, we take turns beating up on as we do our little demos. I'm gonna post this link here in the bottom in the chat. I do that every week, just so you can have a link to this, this about page. And this way you don't have to go searching for stuff all over the place. Those four links will get you to everything the forum does. Is, this is our just quick look at what we're doing here. The big focus that we had in the beginning when we started back in 2018 was really on CMDB, but we changed our focus about a year and a half ago to digital transformation because that's what we're really trying to do with the part of the CMDB that we're looking at. So our mission is to help all of our people that are in the group uh, participate in their own transformations using the ServiceNow platform. Uh, shared work is in all forms. The videos are probably the main forms and also the presentation. So stealing a slide or two from the presenters is usually what happens so that you could talk about it more internally. And then our EA team is the one who hosts this. The main way to get information is in these bi-weekly calls. So if you're here for the first time, that gives you the 10,000 foot view of what the digital services forum is. For the next part, so I'm gonna hand it over to Martin. And I think you're going to take share, right, Martin? Uh, yeah, well, Mark's going to share, but thank you, John. Um, let's go ahead and get started here. So thanks, everyone, for joining. See a lot of common names on the forum here. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm, I'm part of the Enterprise Architecture team here at ServiceNow. I'm honored to have two guys with us, Mike Osterling, who's a co-author of a, pretty much the de facto standard, I, I like to think, um, around value stream mapping. Um, and then, of course, uh, Mark Bodman, who's over our data foundations, our CSDM, CMDB product manager. So today, um, what I want to start off with is a, a quick poll, if we can get that going, John. So and, and as we start taking um, down some of your responses, really start to explain why we're here. Um, value stream mapping, value stream management. It's 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 this concept that's been around for so long, but really starting to you know pick up even more steam and more trends within the industries. Um, we'll, we'll talk about what it means to different personas and different folks in the organization and and and, and across the different enterprises. But really, what um, I, I'll tell you a quick story. It, you know what the the thing I love about it the most when I get to go work with leaders in different companies and different organizations. When I look at value stream mapping, it's really the 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 big rocks beneath the river. Right? So the, the 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 river waters, you know, seem smooth on top, but it's all those things underneath that are kind of hidden and exposed, right? I was working with um, a customer a few weeks ago, and I'll give a simple example. We're just talking about recruit to retire end to end. You look at like HR, what HR is doing, and their processes. They're like Martin. We're fully automated. We're going from talent when offers accepted. We're auto creating um, accounts in our HCM. Um, we're notifying the right people. Like everything's great, but they still can't get to day one readiness. Right? Still taking four to five days to get somebody access and all these provisionings and offices and security. So we go to IT and says IT, you know what's going on? They're like we are fully automated. You know, we, we've got AD account creation, auto creation, adding the right access, adding the right um, applications, but it's still taking five days. Getting these folks into a room together to start looking at all the intricacies across how value is delivered, in this case, data readiness, you start to look at all the manual things that have to happen, right? Oh, it's because John has to, you know, hiring manager John has to email um, IT or submit this form sits on someone's desk, they have to send this email, create, update the spreadsheet. So it, it's all these things that are painfully obvious, but we don't know about it until we actually get in the room with folks and start looking at end to end, right? So at the end of the day, yes, you could spend, um, it, it, it's, you're going to have a value stream map that's produced. And we'll show some examples and talk about what that is. But the real value isn't the actual map. It's the fact that the, the collective journey of getting folks together and actually being able to make 
visible, what was invisible. And it's usually those things that are painfully obvious. Um, we, we just don't know it because we get so mired down in our organizational bounds and silos. Um, so I'm really excited about this. So let's look at the poll. We asked three questions. Does your organization have a clear definition of what value streams are within its operation? It looks like uh, about 30% of respondents right now say yes, 70% say no. And then for those that have um, said you yes. Want to, you want me to put that up so that everybody can see it? Oh, yes, yes. Or are you, are you able to see the results live? I, I can see them. I don't know if everyone else can see them right now. Etta, can you see them? No, I still see the questions. I think I'll, I can end it if you want, Martin, and put it up for everybody. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, and then for those that responded, um, you know, we, we want to know if then, you know, if, if you're looking through the lens of value streams, are we seeing measurable, notable improvements in performance and delivery? Uh, and then this, this last question is really, really interesting to me and something because when we use the term value stream, it's a very specific term that has different connotations and definitions and meaning. But at the end of the day, we're looking across how values delivered end to end within a certain area, right, across different organizational bounds. So we, there's different terms used for it. And a lot of organizations are looking through the lens of a value stream without even calling it a value stream, right? So today, as you go through and you hear from Mike and Mark and others, keep that in mind, right? Even if your leadership or part of your strategic planning efforts that you're not really using that term, um, we're still looking at ways to break down across multiple BUs, multiple organizational units, processes, activities, et cetera. Sorry. Can I just ask a quick question on that? On the, on the third one, it's like they're calling it something else other than value streams. Can we ask, what are they calling it? Um, I would actually... Would love or at for, the end, or I can put it in the q and I would actually love the audience to tell me what else you know, you're hearing in your organization. I can tell you what I hear from some of the clients I work with, but I'd really love to hear what other folks um, call it within their own um, businesses. A good idea. If we can drop that in the uh, in the chat, that'd be great. Awesome. Uh, well, Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you. They're not here to hear me talk, so I'll, I'll let you take over from here. Uh, if you have questions throughout, please raise your hand, ask a question, throw it in the chat. We'll be monitoring. So, uh, Mike, go ahead. It's all you. Great. And I see people are putting in the chat what some of those terms are. That's great. Um, Thank you, Martin. Thank you, John. And um, I'm looking forward to doing this. Mark and I uh, have, uh, actually, we go back about five and a half years. And uh, we did a, a thing together at IT for IT Forum back in San Diego. And um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. It's morning here. I'm in San Diego. Excited to get going here, guys. So what Mark and I want to do today is kind of go over what this value stream mapping is, why we do it, what the purpose is give it, provide an introduction to this concept of value stream management, and then kind of compare them and talk about what's the difference or, how, you know, value stream mapping versus value stream management. We also want to hit on the, uh, the standardized digital product uh, value stream. So IT for IT, the reference architecture. Um, we're going to touch on how do we improve and manage value streams and why value streams are preferred by uh, strategic partners. And then we'll talk just a little bit about how you need help if you're looking for support. What can ServiceNow do to support you guys? What can I do for you to, to help you guys out? Um, so actually, I love uh, what Martin's introduction was. In his introduction, he talked about value streams and value stream mapping and the, the, the rocks in the river analogy. And, and as Martin said, sometimes it looks smooth on the surface, but if you get underneath, there's a whole bunch of turbulence. And I'm going to say on the surface, lots of times there's dams that get in the way. So it ain't always flowing. And I love that analogy and the visual that value stream comes, uh, that, that it provokes. So when we talk about where did this come from, I mean, this is, this is nothing new. But I'm going to say it's really, really critical. And so the first time somebody put a, the term value stream mapping was in this book that uh, uh, Jim Womack and Dan Jones put together 20, yikes, <laughs> 24 years ago or whatever the math is on that. And um, so they kind of, it was interesting. In lean thinking, they said there's five 
principles, if you will, of lean thinking and the lean enterprise. And they said, hey, the customer, the external customer, the end customer are the folks that define value. And then what we need to do as an organization is really understand what that whole thing is from beginning to end. What, what is, and they, they labeled it value stream, from, from that first request until that end user, end customer has in hand or has available the thing that they're requesting, what are all the steps that are required? And, and so they talk about value stream thinking, and it's not just understanding what goes from you know, that beginning to end experience. It's also manage, monitoring, managing, and improving the value streams. And then real quick, the other three principles was one, of, one was about create flow. That's that river analogy. Okay, how do we keep that moving, that, that water moving forward without hitting, hitting eddies and turbulence and, and dams and things like that? So we're trying to create flow. How do you, how do you reduce the stops and disruptions in the delivery of that value? And the fourth principle is at the pull of the customer. So when they want it, at the time they want it, and you know they might not want it to take a year to get that thing from beginning to end. So how do we accelerate that in a in a in a responsible and an effective way? And then the fifth principle is talking about continuous improvement and pursuit of perfection. And it's interesting when we look at these in organizations that have been doing trying to adopt these lean thinking principles. Um, it's shocking how infrequent it is that that second principle of value stream, understanding your value stream, monitoring, managing, and improving the value stream, the value stream thinking does not, is not pervasive. We live in silos and silos, departments, functions, whatever it may be. And one of the things we see is that, hey, within the different silos, we may be getting our stuff together. We may be optimizing, we may be improving, but is it at the expense of somebody else? I wanna, so again, what is a value stream? It's everything from beginning to end. And I'm gonna tell you a story. So I'm based in San Diego. Um, I've been doing this lean stuff for 25 years, something like that. And one of the engagements uh, I've had over the years is with uh, the U.S. Navy and a specific command out here called Southwest Regional Maintenance Center, it's a SWARMAC. Any naval ship that comes into San Diego Harbor, actually, anytime it comes in, it's going to get some type of service, okay? Anything that has to happen goes through this group called SWARMAC. It's a big place. I mean, they've got something like 70 different I'm going to call them shops, but they aren't all physical shops because there's a lot of knowledge work, a lot of, a lot of uh, engineering, a lot of um, systems work, and, and as well as the mechanical stuff. And so as a command, what they did a number of years ago was they said, let's look at these 70 shops and 70 work providers, service slash uh, product providers. And they said, recognizing that the mission of the Navy cannot be accomplished in the port, how do we get shipped back out to sea as quickly as possible? And they said, let's look at all of these different providers and identify which of these are the shops that are most prone or at risk of holding up getting ships back out to sea. So they narrowed it down. They had a, I, I don't even remember what the list was. They had nine or 10 of these services and shops that held things up. And one of them was, they called it, it's a misnomer, they called it the paint shop. What the paint shop did was this specific shop, they took these ladders that you see here, and what they would do is they would service these ladders on regular maintenance or repairs or whatever it was. And what they found out that was that this was one of their bottleneck, one of their constraints in getting ships back out to sea. So we could look at it from a high level. There's five different steps. Take a ladder off the ship. QC does an assessment on it. In the middle there, the engineering and planning group does a, puts together a work plan. Then they actually repair or do the service to it in the shop. And then finally they mount it, test it, sign it off and get it back on the ship. And that's done by the dockside personnel. Knowing what the processes is not enough. And I'm gonna say fixing everything is probably the wrong thing to do. We only have limited resources to to, 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 to take care of stuff. And so what this group did was they said, where are the constraints? 
they put some metrics together and they said, hey, what's the work effort or PT is process time. And the second row underneath each of those blocks, it says LT, that's the lead time or turnaround time. And actually a very revealing uh, 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 metric is this thing that says percent C and A or percent complete and accurate. So what percent of the time are we getting the stuff right in the first time? And when they put this all on a summary timeline and visualize that, it became painfully clear where the biggest leverage points were. And what we saw was if we start looking at, hey, our total lead time, beginning to end, the value stream delivery turnaround time was something like 66 days. And within those 66 days, there's about 120 some hours of work. And if you do the math on this, I don't have it up here right now, but if you do the math on this, it's, it's just around 10% of the time the thing is actually being worked on or it's getting transformed to process time divided by lead time. And so the constraints there, we highlight the constraints there and they say, where are our leverage points? Look at that, 30 days to get it through the shop, 27 days to get it through the engineering and planning group. And actually look at that percent complete and accurate of 50% within the engineering group. It's not about turnaround time <laughs> or it's not just around turnaround time or lead time, but it's also about, hey, what, how are we doing? Where are the, where are the biggest boulders? <laughs> these aren't rocks, these are boulders. And what is it that we gotta work on? Again, without some type of direction like this, it's really hard to know where do we, where do we, where do we assign, where do we commit those valuable resources, whether they be people, time, money, whatever it is. And it's pretty cool. Once they did that, and this was done with leaders, and let, let's go back to slide just for a second, Mark, please. Um, sure. That when we did the when they did the current state map, it was with the leaders of the different functions in the room. So leaders the decision makers, the people with the authority and or influence to make decisions, not just on where to put those resources, but what those resources needed to work on. So um, three big deliverables from a value stream map, from a value stream mapping perspective, okay? One is what's going on today? Where's the pain? Where are those leverage points? This is Pareto stuff, 80-20, okay? Where are we gonna get the most bang for our buck? So three deliverables, current state map, what's happening today, where's the pain? Future state map, what do we think this could look like? And what these guys did was their timeline was for this specific shop, their timeline was, their timeline was, uh, was 12 months. Where could we be in 12 months? It's pretty cool. Now, what this activity stimulated was focused workshops. Maybe people have heard Kaizen events, whatever the label is. It's focused workshop, or it might be projects or whatever it is to say, how do we bring this down? How do we improve the delivery? And what they were able to do um, in the repair shop, they were able to take it from 30 days down to five days. And that was just pretty straightforward. That was hey, we just need to physically rearrange stuff, physically balance the work. I got real involved in the work plan with the engineering and planning folks. Uh, their goal, actually, their original goal was bring this down to five days from 27 days. And no bull, when we talk about this, they were able to take it from 27 days down to two days. Now, mm. did they get it all done in day one? No, they didn't, okay? But this took about 30 days before they transitioned from this is the way that the engineering and planning group works today to what it could be. Part of that was part of that was technology, part of it was workflow, part of it was cross-training. It was uh, it was pretty cool. Part of it was standardization uh, and simplification. Pretty cool stuff. Check that out. Lead time in the far right from 66 days to 16 days. This was not just a plan but it started with current state map, future state map. Third deliverable from a value stream mapping activity is how are we gonna get there? What's the transformation plan? So again, the people with the authority, the people with the influence have to be in the room to make those commitments. And they were, and now the people that did the actual improvement were closer to the front lines, people that understand what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, 
So, Mark, you want to hit this one? Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I got involved with is IT for IT, and, and we, we developed that to be able to address running IT more like a business. And there's a lot of value in how we apply this thinking in what we do. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to automate, uh, to, to make things more standard and efficient. And there are um, activities, I call them movements, like DevOps. Um, these dev-centric processes have always been sort of a, a bottleneck in the IT organization. And, it's, and then you need to pr have these fast production iterations. And we've kind of made some definitely improvements in the industry like around that. But the speed is not alone. It's not just about driving faster, but having better quality control over how fast you're going and where you're going um, to, to basically look at other metrics like productivity or uh, uh, innovation aspects that you need to invest in as well. And uh, the, the thing that's, you know, happened in our organization, uh, the world, basically, everything has become digital. And so IT underpins almost everything we do from the manufacturing process to just tracking the, the ship process uh, that you just kind of went through there, Mike. You know, there's, there's IT involved in, in coordinating and tracking all those things. Even if the work is all manual labor, we're still tracking it. And I, I, I remember I've had a, a discussion with our own Dave Wright about this because workflows in, in themselves are digital and we are assigning tasks in our own platform based on um, tracking and, and managing that flow based on uh, workflows that we define. So IT pin, underpins almost everything we do. Yeah, and it's interesting that you point that out, Mark, because the roots of value stream mapping, actually, some people attribute it to something that they were doing in the in Toyota, and yes. it was, they called it material and information flow. Yes, and TPS. So, yes, yeah, exa exactly. Yep. Yes. Um, the other thing, you know, I think Martin talked about, you know, all of these different systems and such in an organization. And one of the things if I was listening well, Mark, uh, Martin, that you mentioned was, hey, the new hire process. What's everything that's required from, we need somebody to fill this role. There's an identification of a need until that person is on in-house and executing. One of my favorite VSM or value stream mapping activities was actually, um, it wasn't just the new hire process, it was the hire to retire process. And so what are all the systems that not that a person touches, but that touches that person or touches the information about that person. And uh, boy, was that a revealing exercise. And the ironic thing was that was with a software development company. And the man manual iterations and the manual uh, touches in that process were, uh, were painful, but that was a great motivator. What we're trying to do, you guys, is it's not about it's not about how to how well does each department work. It's about that optimizing that overall delivery of services to the or overall delivery of, of value to that end user and customer. And I don't know if you guys ever feel like this. You know, we're supposed to be doing what we see here, but sometimes it feels like we're fighting each other, and um, we don't we're not even aligned on true north. So the question is. If we're not talking, if we don't have a common understanding, a truly common understanding of what's going on today, how are we gonna get going in the right direction? So when we talk about value stream mapping, it's from a high level. It's a macro view of what's going on. We're not trying to figure out what's keeping people from, you know, what's, what's causing the backup necessarily and fixing that backup. Let me rephrase that. We're not trying to fix everything within a value stream mapping activity. We're trying to identify where those constraints are. So we put the resources at the right place and there's alignment on that. So again, value stream mapping, high level look at things, making sure that we're aligned. We've got a common understanding of what's going on in the current state. We're collaborating to make sure that we're, we're all working towards a common future state that we agree on what we should be working on and what that performance should look like. And we're getting consensus on, yes, this is what we're committing to in terms of how are we gonna get there. The fifth principle that, that I talked about in that book was, uh, was pursuit of perfection, continuous improvement. And that means you don't fix a value stream performance once. We've gotta go back and, and look at it again and again, especially in the environments that we live in 
customer requirements are changing, technology is changing, we're learning new stuff, and so we've got to make this an iterative thing. I really want to reiterate that this is a high level look at things. I love process maps. This ain't a process map. Okay. With just a process map, we don't know where the issue This says this is what's supposed to happen, but how often is what's supposed to happen really happening? And where are the metrics and where's the pain? Okay. I don't have any issues with process maps. I don't have any issues with, with swim lanes. Okay. I love the, hey, who's doing what and what are the handoffs? but these are more detailed. This is what we get into when we're actually saying, um, how do we fix it as opposed to what do we need to focus on? Hey, Mike. Oh, so, yeah. Can I stop you on this for a second? Because what you're saying here on the value streams and the process maps is really important because sometimes people take the value streams as the process maps instead of taking value streams, mapping them to business capabilities, so we get those two together and you can do that on the ServiceNow platform. Your business process comes later. Your business process is not the value stream. And I have to tell you, we have a hard time with customers getting them there. And yeah. so, yeah. you know, we have a kind of interesting way of, of starting them down the value stream path and then mapping it to the business capabilities. And then we get the into the details of the business process later. But this one, this is so key because it's hard for us. We're, we're a partner. It's hard to get the customer to get that headspace. Number one, they don't have any concept of value streams. They only have business process. So this one is really important. And so, yes, uh, thank, I, I had to come for, off mute to do that. Thanks for, thanks for pointing that out, Etta. Um, and one way that I help people differentiate those, what we're seeing here are steps within a process and a value stream map is the processes, not the step. So there, you know, each process, hey, that engineering and planning in the example, 27 days and 50 hours of effort, that was not those, that was, it was not one step that was dozens of steps to execute and deliver that. So what we're trying to do with value stream mapping is kind of set that direction. What is it going to look like down the road? Get that buy-in. And if we do this, you guys, and it gets, it gets everybody aligned and where we're going, it can have this profound and very, very impactful effect in terms of how fast can we move forward. Thanks, uh, Mike. That's definitely uh, my experience as well over the last few years. And um, I want to now address something called value stream management that is kind of come up in the last few years uh, and maybe created some confusion or maybe some misunderstanding of what the differences are, what the similarities are. And so when we look at value stream management, I like to look at some of where those terms are first coined and what analysts are saying about it. And one of the first, I would say, uh, trustworthy sources that I saw on, on this particular term was from a Forbes article, I think in our, uh, four or five years ago, at least, where they defer basically defined it as a lean practice to determine value of software deployment, development and delivery efforts and the resources. So uh, you can see that out there now. Um, the other sources that come from the analysts in the space have created value stream management solutions and platform market definitions. And as such, they look at vendors such as ourselves that kind of instrument and manage and meter how the value streams are moving in the software space. Uh, so uh, more or less end to end from idea to, to you know, software produced and value consumed of the consumers. And last, there's, there's also something called the VSM consortium that we were one of the founding members of, and that is a consortium to help organizations kind of adopt these principles in the value stream uh, space for the software organizations. Um, and so there's other vendors uh, that, that are in that same space that con contribute to the VSM consortium, but that's just another area where you see the movement kind of getting picked up. Sorry, I was uh, on mute. In our industry. Um, this is just some simple uh, form updates. There's a couple of Wayne? minor requests in there to update some catalog items. Other than that, it's, it's all very... What? cosmetic um there's not really any process driven stuff that's changed wayne i think you're you're off mute now i don't know if you meant that for us he's doing a demo 
<laughs> All right. Thanks. I think we got them. <laughs> All righty. Um, so let's do a, a quick comparison because I, I know that I was confused when I first saw it. I'm thinking, what's the difference? What are the similarities? And they basically, they're both based on lean principles. So we can basic, we can say that for sure. Um, however, mapping is that top-down executive-oriented exercise to define the maps, which I think is very valuable, as Mike just pointed out, versus a market category for software delivery and practices, which is what we find the value stream management uh, being all about. Um, the, the thing about mapping, as you saw from Mike, it could be about ladders or software or anything. It's really any product for any customer. And then the, on the management side, really focuses on that software-oriented um, aspects, not necessarily a broader definition in that market space. And last is really the, the mapping is a valuable tool to, to use in aligning those different silos. However, in the on the value stream management side, it's really focused on full lifecycle software product delivery, which is fine too, but just keep that in mind. Now, one of the things I really want to stress too, at least is what we believe, we believe the management of any value stream should be applied. So you don't you don't really do this for software only, but if it's ship ladders, that's fine. It, it could be anything, any service, any product uh, you know, good that basically needs to be managed and then delivered to some consumer to provide value. I, I want to take a moment to kind of walk through the digital product value streams that we've created within the IT for IT standard. And IT for IT has been around for a while. And by the way, I wanted to mention, Mike, that your book inspired the addition of the value stream layer in the architecture itself. So, um, so there's kind of three, four main layers that we have within uh, the standard itself. Uh, the first one being value streams, and there's seven now. We used to have four. Uh, so those have expanded and, and they've been reoriented to be more applicable to what happens in a modern delivery organization. So we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. There's a data object layer, which are the metrics and the description of the digital products and services and the way you're offering those to customers and how you're tracking and managing the, the as is. Um, the functional components, which are the, the work that's done, they're functional components because they apply to the people and jobs that are done, but also the automation that can be applied in each of those jobs. Uh, a lot of tooling is available there too. And last but not least is the groupings of those functions because we typically see tools being integrated into these groupings and value streams may cut across many different tools, many different functions and teams and groupings. And in the IT for IT standard, with the, these are the different groupings we have at the high level. Uh, you'll see digital product on the upper left and the different value streams kind of connecting the dots between the different groupings. Um, and also you're seeing the release, the service offer and the product, actual product instances being defined within the actual standard. Um, when we define the standard, we also considered people and machines as different types of consumers and also internal or external consumers. One of the, I think, challenges organizations have is being able to treat each other like consumers or customers. Now, you're not paying you know, each other real money, but across organizations, across, if you were supposed to provide, let's say, uh, compute as a platform, as a service to others, that's an internal consumer versus actually charging for compute uh, when you're actually having an external consumer. And in the standard, we defined three portfolios. We've, we're extending that where you've got a, a, a request to add another portfolio. We'll, we'll get into that in a minute, but it's really the market facing digital products that you actually sell and be, be able to provide value to end customers who pay you. And we organize that by product lines. We have the employee facing um, deliverables. So those are going to be, you know, HR services like like you, you talked about there, Mike, hire to retire. Those are all important. And then we have foundational services, which you build others on top of. So shared IT services are typical there, or even platforms we're seeing as a shared component that others build upon to do market-facing stuff or employee-facing digital products. And the last but not least is the tool chains themselves or manufacturing. So those are automation. Those are digital products that are there to basically provide those products to those end users or employees or uh, to be able to provide foundational services to others. So, so that's kind of what IT for IT defines. And we also 
move into the, the seven value streams. If we get in a little bit more detail, we got the evaluate, which is all about the gathering influencers between the market, internal influencers, existing products and services that you sell or use. You wanna be able to um, explore potential investments that you can make uh, in each digital product. Again, product being a good or service or both. Uh, you need to integrate those, which is about planning the release, uh, building it or buying it, implementing it, and then providing it to be used. Uh, deploy is being able to deploy that new release uh, as it's ready to be go going into production. Not every release will be provided to others. Uh, you know, if you do continuous integration, you'll, you'll know about that. Um, the release uh, value stream, which is where we define the offer and how it's consumed. Sometimes all we do is change the offering. We might change the price to accommodate higher cost of goods, for example. And last but not least is the consume. Well, actually, the consume value stream is one more after this. But the consume is really how do we provide the ability to consume a standard offering once it's been described in a catalog, um, and, on, and then for, for tracking those in terms of a, a status. Then last but not least is operate, which is where we basically detect and correct issues that are found and uh, operationally. And that could be, you know, something in the customer's hands or something internally that are used between companies or, or different uh, business units. Uh, yes, you had a question? I did. I so on this, so, so we would define the value streams as evaluate, you know, explore, integrate, you know, blah, 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 blah. The is would be the different piece value you know gather influencers identify the gaps blah 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 right and then under that you would then define the business capabilities so it's like three layers right well and and, and, and what i'm looking at is because i'm looking at setting this up in spm so i would set up the value stream as your one two three four five six seven Etta, I'm losing you. Is it me or is it you? It's Etta. Okay. I don't. I, don't, uh, I think we can let let let's continue, and Etta will follow up offline to to talk exactly through the the SPM components of that. Perfect. Yeah, and, Thank you. And I appreciate that. Yeah, and and that is something that we could have a follow up session with. I've been chatting with Caitlin. More, um, Morris and Karina Hatfield about that. So that's something we can definitely have another session on. No, no, Th thank you, thank you. Cause I'm in the process of, of putting that together now. And I, sure. I think, you know, as we're bringing in new work we wanna be able to follow this, but it, it we gotta be able to configure it in the tool, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we'll, so I'll, I'll get to that a little bit at the end cause we are, We've got a number of different investments we're making around that, especially in a Utah release where we now can capture value stream information within the platform. So um, just to finish out some of the other concepts within the, within the IT criteria reference architecture, we can actually map those value streams down into the functional components and the other objects that are actually managed within those. Uh, in this case, the integrate value stream has a number of scenarios to introduce new or initial product releases to configure off the shelf stuff, uh, deliver emergency changes or even updated vendor product as uh, those are a value used by internal folks or by customers. And so all, all of these are sort of different um, triggers. These scenarios are different triggers for the same steps that we would take in that integrate value streams. And underneath are all the functional components that are involved. Uh, so, uh, which which kind of cross all of those different teams or tools if you're using using different tools. And one of the advantages of being on the platform, of course, is that some of these tools might be already integrated pretty well. Uh, this is just the full view of the IT for IT architecture with uh, the two of the main layers: the data architecture and also the functional com um, components and and groupings. So you can see how that all kind of strings together. The one thing I would I wanted to also highlight is that in version three, we added a value stream for each digital product. The idea here is each product is participating in a value stream of some sort that you implement in a typical IT organization according to those four portfolios. So we want to know uh, how is this uh, you know, IT investment contributing to the value streams, either hire to retire or delivering something to a customer, for example. 
And well, we recently mapped a lot of the products that we sell to the IT for IT architecture. So uh, my colleague Ian Liu just published some work that a lot of team members here contributed to, to show how ServiceNow provides value or tools in, the, in each of these areas. Um, so that's something to definitely look at. Uh, and this is just an example of something I've done with customers in the past, where we look at a typical value stream of for a customer and we, we use the IT for IT definition to uh, identify those steps. Um, the, the, as a reference architecture, you can extend it. It's a good place to start. Uh, you can reference this to see you know, what you're doing or not doing and kind of use this as a, as a, as a template in order to kind of define your own. Um, and in this case, looking at the, the integrate value stream, we're identifying a couple issues. And the first couple of issues that we see here are, are basically the planning and design processes. Also the build, integrate, and test processes seem to be a bit higher in the correct and accurate numbers aren't that good. The lead time is pretty high and the process time is uh, pretty low. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, there's not a good ratio there according to that. Uh, and this is what we typically see in, in a waterfall development process where the batch sizes are very high. You know, you're doing all your planning up front, then development, then test at the end. And in this case, we have a customer that's basically made a lot of configuration policy mistakes. They don't follow policy. They're not setting up the config files properly between environments. And a lot of that can be um, basically caught way at the end. Um, so in this case, we were able to reference what we do in each of these areas, and we kind of look at a couple of things like product backlog. In the product backlog area of the IT for IT architecture, we find that we have got a number of products that we can help improve things to adopt agile methodologies, to integrate with existing agile tools that, that the organizations are already using, and to put DevOps insights workspace in, in place to kind of look at the DevOps processes and start to measure and meter uh, all of the continuous integration and continuous deployment processes that you have. Um, and the other thing that we also have in test area, we have something called DevOps config. And that's another area that we can automate the evaluation of your config files to kind of eliminate some of those challenges that customers might make. And so when you apply these things, we're gonna address some of those problems by moving to more of an agile process, which basically changes our batch size. So our batch size was 50 before we were doing everything at once, but looking at this in a 14 day sprint exercise, we're able to move the batch size down and adjust and make everybody's work much more efficient uh, across the, the whole deliverable of the same 50 requirements. We have also added a config policy test, DevOps config, in order to eliminate some of the config problems that were happening and testing those configs for each, for each of the deployments. So we're not making mistakes, we're actually catching them before the deployment happens. Um, so yeah, we've reduced in this case, those same 50 requirements, we've reduced our, our process time to 30, 53 days and lead time only 70 for the same 50 requirements. All right, so that's my IT for IT example, applying some of what we know from a ServiceNow perspective, some of our product areas and, and using as an evaluation uh, criteria for what you do or don't do in an organization. So, and some of the, yeah, go ahead, Mike. So it's, it's interesting what comes to the surface when you get all the different players in the room and you're talking about, um, hey, things, things are working great in my area, but that may yeah. not be true from a downstream perspective or even from an up, upstream perspective. And sometimes getting our, our colleagues in the room with us uh, brings a lot of these things to the surface. And I know, you got, I know no one here will recognize any of these issues, but when we get our current state map together, one thing I don't think I iterated enough is within the, especially current state value stream mapping activity, what we're trying to do is identify those pain points. Those are those rocks that Martin opened up with. Uh, what are the rocks, some of them hit, some of them sticking above the surface of the river that, that we should be addressing. And so some of the things we say is, hey, there's a lot of tribal knowledge, or maybe there's a lot of randomness. We don't have standards. We don't have automation where automation makes sense. Um, we are looking at things not just from a process management, but also from a technology or tools perspective within our silos and not necessarily integrating those well with the other pieces of the, of, of the value stream. Yeah, and um, I just wanted to, I just want to iterate that on that, Mike, because one of the reasons I joined ServiceNow is because we 
are natively integrating everything on our platform. The cost of integrating those silos is very low, which is uh, a huge value proposition for platforms by themselves. And actually, it goes. I think it goes hand in hand with the next bullet here. And we talk about, um, hey, maybe the technology. We've got the technology, but are we really fully utilizing it? Yes. And and I think some of that comes from knowledge silos or awareness silos, and we don't even know that uh, what somebody else is doing. Um, as Mark's example showed, way too often we see delayed testing or delayed. You know, if it's software in the IT environment, the service environment, you know, it, it's the testing issues. Um, and then what happens after the testing's done, there's just bucket loads of testing, or I'm sorry, of rework. And sometimes we're, we're behind the eight ball and maybe we're not even able to do the rework that, that really should be happening. And it's like, well, it's good enough. We got to launch, baby. So, yeah. um, it, it and one of the things that the agile kind of adds to the mix is with the smaller batch sizes, you can change your mind or get early feedback and make your, you know, if, if figure out that ambiguity. So you're not building something that's wrong. You know, at the end of a year, you'll know it's wrong, but uh, it's too late there. You've already made your whole investment. I see Michael, you got Michael's hands up. Uh, you got a quickie? Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, Mark, I want to echo what you just said, which is the beauty of the service now platform is, of course, that it takes away that overhead of integrating because it's all sitting on the same platform. So I just need to make the tables or modules talk to each other. The greatest challenges there, I think we all collectively might face is the, I'm going to call it the old school mentality of go get best of breed and bring them in. Because to this day, I still have to continue to fight with a lot of, I don't know if I would maybe push against the resistance of, well, I'm just going to go get Jira and I'm going to go get the testing suite. I'm like, no, 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 stop it use yes. what you have here you it's all in the same platform and let's take the cost of the integration right into adding more value to you and i think um i don't know if you if you have anything that some wisdom you want to share with us in terms of how do we make the case for that better absolutely right? i mean and you're you're echoing something from my own experience when i was in a, in a, my previous employer uh, here at, uh, in, in Austin, I used to make all my buying decisions based on looking at the Ma Magic Quadrant or Forrester Wave and buying the top three. You know, those are the only three I would look at, where in reality, it's the cost of integrations that add to the mix, which you can't necessarily see when you're when you're making those kinds of decisions, right? It's a uh, it's, well, it, it really the ROI here, right? Yeah. Yeah, time, time to value is really it. And even implementing the tools and the automation, that's a huge factor. Even if we're not best of breed for a specific thing, because we're integrated, we make up for it in that fact alone. Hey, Mark, we also had a good question from Kenneth in the chat. I want to call this out. So he's talking about the VSM flow. Kenneth, correct me if I'm wrong here. You're talking about the duration times. I'm assuming that's the lead time, cycle time, some of those uh, attributes that were captured and shown on the slide. And Kenneth is asking if um, if that view reflects the capability of ServiceNow uh, and, and you know what what now can do. Um, it, it, theoretically, yes, I, it does involve other things like processes and other people changes. Like going from a, a waterfall to agile process, it, re, it involves a lot more than just the tools. So, but it is but it is you know going back to some of the things that Mike was highlighting. You need to get everybody involved to to make that change to happen. It's not just the tool, but everybody, leader, leadership, uh, even the cons consumers need to be able to expect more frequent deliverables, right? Because uh, sometimes you're just used to the old way and waiting a year, but maybe it's faster and your consumers need to be ready for it, which we're seeing because we're so fast now, we're, we're delivering our own products every quarter. <laughs> our customers can barely keep up themselves. So we're starting to experience some of that already too. Excellent. So a few other things that we talk, um, Mark, why don't you talk to this one too here? Yeah. Yeah. This match the design to dev efforts. And that's another, you know, pet peeve from my experience. And uh, once you do have a design, you want to make sure dev efforts match that design and they're delivering what you're expecting. Um, you know, so the age old problem is, you know, what you designed is not necessarily what you get, but that's, that's got to be tighter but more tightly managed. And we have uh, partners actually on the, on the call here to help in that regards too. So one of the other things that we see a lot is when we manage by silos, we manage our skills by silos. 
and yes. we miss opportunities for folks to actually get engaged, not just get engaged, but actually understand and participate in some of the work or activities of other silos. Another dimension of this over-specialization, I'm going to say it's over-specialization, or I don't know what the right word is exactly, but we rely on our leaders to do the management, and we don't develop and we don't let our people manage their own processes, the things that can be pro that they, that can be managed. And so over specialization may just may not be just skills, but it's also in the management role. So we see lots of handoffs, we see way too many handoffs. Uh, some of the other things that we see are there's lots of uh, big batches. Uh, Mark was talking about that. Hey, you've got, you know, whatever it is, five story, five stories, 50 features, 50 requirements, and I'm trying to work on everything at once, and that can slow everything down. Big batches result in multitasking and slowing stuff down. Um, hey, I know, I know where the bottlenecks are in my silo, but does, who, mm -hmm. who really knows and understands where the bottlenecks are in the value stream? Yeah, and I just want to highlight a lot of times it's the it's they're not talking. You're not it, it's somewhere between the two processes, and you don't realize it, right? You're, you you sent something to this other team, and it sits there for months before somebody actually gets to it. Absolutely, yeah. In fact, in the tip in a straightforward process map, it doesn't even show up on the process map because we don't no. have those reworks built in there, or we don't have metrics built in, and so no. we don't understand performance issues. So, hey. If you're going to go from where we are today to where we want to be in six months, nine months, 12 months, whatever that might be, you got to have a plan to get there. Three deliverables, current state and pain. What can we do about it? Future state. And then the real important thing is a transformation plan that's being actively worked. This is a set of hypotheses. I mean, we come out of a value stream mapping activity. My experience has been 80 to 90% of the stuff that we came up with holds water. And 10 or 20% of it, it's like, well, what were we thinking that day? Or no, we've got to tweak it. Maybe it has to be done a little bit differently. Pretty responsible, you know, deliverable that's dynamic. Yeah. All hey, right. Mike, somebody asked in the chat, great concepts and experience in the future. Could someone show how to build and use the value streams in the ServiceNow platform? Do you think this would be a good example to be able to map into ServiceNow? I'll let you take that one, Mark. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think it can. I, again, I think that's a, an area that we can get more, I guess, uh, elaborate. Uh, you know, we don't have the time to really address that. Uh, but I've already been, you know, discussing that with Katrina Hatfield as a potential follow-up to this session. But okay. yeah, we can okay. get into that. But and Mark, and I can... Go ahead. We lost, might have her, lost her yeah workshops okay. as i bring all the silos to the table so yeah, it was alan that asked us. that question it, alan asked that question yeah, yeah you cut out for half of that etta so we're, yeah i think we're having some good. Weird i was going to say alan asked that question it was on that okay and what i said is I, I can help you guys with that i've already i've already got it actually set up <laughs> but it was alan good question alan Etta, can I contact you offline? Yes, ma'am. I mean, yes, sir. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> there you go. Uh, All right. Sorry All right. We're, we're running. We're running no on time here. I want to make sure that we address the last few, few things here. But um, the key, some of the key takeaways here is that you know strategic planning versus ongoing management. That's really the difference between the two terms. You know, and then of course you can go on to about the the market definition. It's not about the map itself, and it's about the conversation and, and understanding across the silos what's going on and understanding how you're creating value for those consumers, wherever that, that might be. Um, you must have the right people in the room. If you don't have the folks that are, uh, I would say, uh, responsible for those silos, they won't have common understanding. You won't have uh, folks recognizing where the effort improvements really need to be. Uh, it's sometimes you're looking at a symptom versus the root cause. When you're putting the whole value stream together, you're able to see that and agree to that. Um, yeah, management and action are actually critical. It's not a, uh, a, a theoretical exercise. You gotta do something about it. 
it for it standard can help identify some of those gaps and opportunities if you don't know where to start, uh, especially from a reference architecture point of view. As architects, you you know it's a very good tool to use to get started and and, and leverage within organizations that are doing software delivery and development. And then last but not least is really management applies to any value stream. So as we kind of highlight this market definition that we, that's been created around software, it doesn't have to be always software. More and more than software is the component of everything we do, but not everything, not always. Now, how can we help? So this is your book, Mike, and uh, I still have my copy here that, that I keep on my desk really close to the heart, and I appreciate that. Like I said, it's changed my world, my thinking. Uh, IT for IT is available. You can get you can get training on this. You can download the architecture uh, documentation. You can browse on it. And then we have two main things I wanted to bring up as possible next steps. One is creating and managing value streams from an SPM perspective, strategic portfolio management. I think that that's one of the things you were you were kind of highlighting here. Um, yes. But, but we are a leader in, in the value stream management wave for Forrester and the Gartner's um, uh, product market definition as well. So this, we're already pretty, I would say, mature when it comes to the VSM and managing software lifecycle from end to end too. So something you, uh, we can actually have a follow-up on. So thoughts, questions. I know we're right at time. We have like one minute left, but we answered lots of questions along the way. Yeah, I think um, with with the few seconds, just want to thank everyone. I think this was a great session, great collaboration. Mike, Mark, thank you so much for coming on. You've got some contact information here. Uh, we do share all the materials of recording on YouTube, our, our, our YouTube channel and on the, uh, the, the .com on our community. So you, you'll be uh, getting all this information as well. But thank you, everyone, for attending and have a great Thursday. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Great questions, great interaction. Appreciate that.